Hello. There we are. Hello, Jason Thomas. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Welcome to uh, episode 26 of the PWBA podcast. I'm Aaron Smith, sitting alongside Jason Thomas. JT, what's up? You're in a brand new place today. I am. I'm in my office at the USBC headquarters in Arlington, Texas. And uh, that that there behind, well, the other side, I got to get my, <laughs> my directions right, is one of my prized possessions, my junior bowling shirt with patches all over it. So I'm really happy to be in my second home. Uh, we have a few folks back in the office this week. Um, Texas, as I mentioned on the last show, is going through some interesting times. Uh, and so we kind of reset our phased in bringing people back to work. And so we're, you know, we're in the beginning phase of that. So I'm back in the office. All right. I, I have seen that shirt before. Usually it hangs behind your, uh, behind your, uh, door, but that's right. Now you're, you're showing it off. I've seen it up close. There's a lot of cool stuff on there. So very awesome. Uh, JT, do we want to get to our uh, special guest for today? Yeah, let's just get right to it because people don't want to hear from us. They want to hear from that's, Valerie. That's a fair point. Right? So yeah. our 2019 PWBA Rookie of the Year, Valerie Bursier. Hey, Val. Hi, everybody. How you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you guys? We're doing great. Doing very well, uh, yeah. You know, despite being in Texas, which is normally great, but uh, right, right about now. Like, what do you guys in Canada think about this whole thing going on in the U.S.? Oh, there's such mixed feelings about it. My my Team Canada teammates, which this is such a blessing in disguise, we've been having team Zooms and we really hardly ever saw each other because we would have one camp a year and then one tournament a year. But since this all started and the isolation and, you know, a couple of us were pretty lonely. So we decided I have a, a personal Zoom room. We all hopped on on Sundays and we just kind of, you know, some of them weren't working. Um, some were working from home, some were completely um, or working normally, you know. And so I think it's just the same as the U.S., although I th I think they're opening up a little slower than what we are here, except for in Michigan, we're opening up the slowest. <laughs> now, smooth. Yeah. Yeah. Just right mm -hmm. out of the gate. You're you're someone's favorite PWBA bowler. Right? That's, That's so awesome. Sweet. Thank you. <laughs> and look at this one. Oh my gosh, Joe. I mean, well, I love him. Have... Nice. So, er, he's so sweet, him and Brandy. Mm. So what so what have you guys been up to? You and your husband? Uh what have you guys been up to, you know, since all this has gone down? Well, I have actually been working more. Uh this is where I, I work. Like I said, I have a, a Zoom room. So I, I work a lot of hours. I don't even know how many hours I work because I don't have to punch a time clock. Uh, and I do still take time for myself on the weekends and uh, my husband, but he has said often because he's furloughed. So he's actually upstairs right now and or well, laid off. I don't know. Either way, um, just not working. Yeah. The moment for Brunswick. And um, well, because when you don't have a really a bowling industry to sell to, you can't really make any money to pay your your people. So. Uh, he at first had a little bit of a hard time with it. He's such a hard worker that he was like, what the heck am I going to do? You know? And so we built a barn door. He built a deck. He built a patio. I'm looking out to our backyard. <laughs> um, planted grass. So you're hoping he's furloughed forever. Oh my God. <laughs> he does. <laughs> he, he, I think, I mean, he's just, although it's funny cause he's not getting, you know, he's getting unemployment, thank God, but he's not getting paid nearly as much as what he was. And so he's like, I think I'm running out of money. <laughs> like, I need to get back to work so I can do more around the house. And, and we still have white walls. We still need to paint, but according to him, it's, uh, uh, winter job to paint inside. We got to do stuff outside right now. And, and we're learning a lot, uh, brand new house, uh, new build. So we didn't even have like fixtures on the, on the drawers and the cabinets. Uh, we didn't have like towel racks. So we had to do all that stuff and that's not really my forte. I'll let him do it. Well, that's, that's always wise. That's how we, it, it runs in my house too. Uh, you know, the toilets get fixed a lot faster these days since I'm home more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. I hear you. There's yeah, when you have the time, then you can do that. That's a whole other story about time, but anyway. 
Now, Val, uh, you mentioned working from home. And for those who don't know, uh, you actually have your own business. You are a registered dietitian and certified health coach, I believe, are all the correct terms. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that and what's a, kind of the day-to-day -day like for you? Yeah, so registered dietitian. Uh, some people equate that to the food police, and I'm not. Uh, well, I'm, I, what I do in a nutshell is when people, what I decided to do was to help people with weight loss. I was in a similar situation to what we're in now, except it was just me. I, really, I felt like it was just me. I was applying for permanent residency and I had to stop working for three months. And then I actually made the mistake of leaving the country because uh, we couldn't afford to hire a lawyer. And so, you know, I left the country, abandoned my application, had to stop working again, reapply. I was a mess. Um, so, because I, I wasn't even getting any income, I had to just literally sit at home and do nothing. And so, I took the "what was me" mentality, and I really think that's actually what caused the shift in me to decide at that point: what do I want to do with my life? What it, what is the what are the client? What's the clientele that I want to work with? Why? Why does that matter to me? And I, so, I decided to kind of tackle the ob obesity epidemic or um, obesity crisis that we have in the US and how weight, losing weight, I always yo-yoed, you know, I was always, and I look back at pictures and I probably had body dysmorphia, meaning like I didn't actually see myself as thin as I was, but cause I was chronically dieting. I was trying to always be skinny. So what I do now is I actually help people lose weight and transform their health in a safe and healthy way, but then also help them trans transform their mindset and their body image and their relationship with food uh, and how I've done that. And I guess sort of successfully, we have a ton of clients that have had incredible transformations, but it's working on me. Like I have to lead from the front. It's almost like taking an insurance policy out for my own health by helping people essentially create better health in their life. Yeah, I'm gonna put up. I'm gonna put up a photo of. Oh you know, somebody. my gosh! Isn't that yeah, amazing? So, yeah, there's a whole bunch of these on your Facebook page that are yeah. just unbelievable. I mean, like, first of all, I've always had issues with, um, you know, I, I used to work out a lot, and you know, I took my shirt off, and it looked like a Salvador Dali painting. Do I need a dietitian? Is that what's missing? Is it? Is it? You know, I'm exercising, but I, I, I you know, don't pay attention to what I eat. Like what, what can I do to make my body look like a regular realist painting and not a Salvador Dali painting? Yeah. You just want to give me a call. <laughs> you have my email. <laughs> I think I will. <laughs> and I help clients all over the U S and it is virtual. And so, um, but we actually have like a, we have a mural placement component and it makes it just, it just gives people the baby steps. And I know that we might talk about, um, if it comes up at all, um, articles that I've written in, in the BTM. Uh, but I always talk about baby steps. Like you can't just, you can't just crash diet and then expect to create those habits long-term. So you have to take those incremental baby steps in order to build on the, the habits to create sustainable transformation. Yeah, I mean, my problem is, uh, I think I would I would rather not take my shirt off at the beach and eat tasty food. Uh, what do you have? Is there any hope that the food that you're recommending for these programs is is not tasting like cardboard? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I don't know if my my personal mentor, uh, Dr. J.C. Dornick, actually has a picture of himself on the beach with his two kids in a shirt. And that's his before picture because he actually, like, he literally said exactly what you said, but he decided that it was, it was worth it to be able to take his shirt off at the beach. Um, how we do it, we actually, I mean, I have little, I have like a chip, I don't have, this as my little snack for later, but it's like a chip type fueling. It's jalapeno cheddar. We've got like chocolate mint bars, um, brownies, cookies, shakes that are super like mocha shakes. I've posted about stuff like that too, because when people are going and getting mocha frappuccinos, I mean, there's like, I don't know, 50 grams of sugar in one of those things. And your blood sugar is just going to spike. It's going to drop. And then you're going to store fat. So um, there is, there is hope. 
Jason. No, thank there you. Is I mean, one of the worst things my mom used to do, I mean, she dro drove me around to all these bowl, like that's how I got all the patches, right? But she drove me around to all the bowling tournaments, but she'd always stop and get us donuts on the way. And like right around game four, I would just, bleh, just it would crash. And that's, mm -hmm. that's why, right? Yes, that's exactly why. Yep. Because the donuts tasted really good, though. <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. And so that is, you know, Jason, honestly, you bring up great points. This is this is literally all I talk about all day, every day. I feel like I'm on one of my coaching calls. <laughs> just, we have to change our relationship. Do we want instant gratification more than we want long term health? Right? Yeah, like who, who what kind of people do you help and how do they find you? And you know, how many people are you talking about? Yeah, so uh, how they find me is typically through either social media. I get a lot of referrals these days because when people have transformations like that, a lot of people are like, hey, what are you doing? You know, which is great for um, for me and my team. And how many people, are you asking me how many clients I have? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the last month, I think I had 50. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, I yeah, it is a lot. Um, it's a lot more. So pre pre COVID, it was probably about thirty six. Oh, look at Sarah. Uh, yeah, she's actually one of my clients she's on my team. Uh, she's so sweet. So yeah, but pre COVID, I, I'm almost <laughs> we I my I doubled my workload. Oh wow! With COVID, yeah. Wow. So before it was it was hovering right around thirty. So. Um, you know, but the thing is, is I check in with my clients 15 minutes a week because our goal is to empower them to take responsibility for their health and their life. I'm not here to be the hero. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to show you, you know, or actually first ask you what you want, why you want it, and then um, show you, hey, you know, when you do this, you'll get results and let's talk about why. Very That's cool. Awesome. Yeah. One Just thing a people health assessment. <laughs> And one of the things we saw on tour this year uh, is that you were essentially doing those calls in between blocks, after blocks, and you, you know, you know, everyone else runs out to go get a quick snack or something, and there's there's Valerie on the phone with her notebook out, the laptop out, uh, you know, especially being your first time out on tour. How much of a transition was that trying to kind of you know be a competitor for eight games, six games, whatever it was, and then transition to putting the job hat on right after that, do that, then focus on yourself and get back to bowling. Also, I'll tell you that <laughs> <laughs> it was hard. It, I was, I knew that it would be challenging. So that's, pr that's pretty much why I didn't commit fully to the tour the previous year uh, was because I was in the middle, I was just starting my business, just starting to build it, starting to really figure out um, even financially, I needed to be in a better space to go out there financially. Every other event that I had bowled prior to last year, I had a backer. So somebody, I didn't have to put up my own money, which was great. Um, but I knew that this year with my business, the where I got it to, I was gonna be able to, you know, front myself and um, potentially make some decent money. And, but I didn't want to have to like freak out about it. So, um, the fact that I could bring my work with me was helpful, but I actually, I made, I made it a point to mostly schedule. And the reason I'm like hesitating is because I know you ca caught me working, <laughs> but I, really, I made it a point to schedule most of my work from Monday through Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. you know, and then when the practice session hit, practice session, and then really not, because there was like, there's practically no time between Thursday evening and then we bowl all day Friday. We get home late or to the hotel late and then get up really early on Saturday if we're fortunate to make it, which, you know, for the most part I was on Saturday and then, you know, make the cut again, bowl top 12. So, you know, Sundays and then I just had to recover on Sundays. And, um, but there were some times where I just had to take calls. And uh, I think for the most part, like I, I don't, I didn't do that well at the Queens. I, you know, got knocked out pretty quickly. So I still wanted to go and watch bowling. So I would take my stuff with me at that point. Yeah. I, you know, we we're finally talking about bowling, which is nice, but uh, uh, it's just a bowling podcast. Uh, <laughs> but, but you made a, a show on the PWBA tour back in 2017. And then, you know, you talked about some of the, you know, why it took you so long to, to come out and bowl a full time. Did you think it was going to be a little easier than it ended up being when you finally did come out on tour full time? 
No way. I knew it was going to be hard. Yeah, no. I Because the events that I did bowl, and I bowled, I bowled enough to still maintain my rookie of the year status, uh, or rookie status. Well, and you also made a show pretty early on in the season in, in 19, right? So I'm, I'm, you probably thought, hey, this is easy. This is this, uh, making shows all the time here. <laughs> I don't even know what was going through my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I think about it now and I'm just like, wow, you know, I just, I just, when I think Deandra talked about it so much on the last podcast, where when you just focus on the process, it, you, the results kind of take care of themselves. And when you do end up stepping outside of yourself and you're focusing on the results, and I had multiple tournaments last year that I did that and it hurt me. So um, the first four events, all I did was just, I just had fun. I just went out there, learned. I hurt myself a little bit because. Yeah. Actually, that's a good point that you, or a good point that I just made in my head. Um, (laughs) I started with the wrist brace and then I, um, with the whole injury thing. So I have just like my forearm just like gets all fired up. And so I really, I committed to the wrist brace for a period of time and then I ended up taking it off partway through. And, um, and I also had to carry, I think I probably have it around the, corner here, but my foam roller with me everywhere because uh, the bowling that many games takes a toll on your body. I mean, holy smoke. So I didn't really prepare all that much because I made a decision to bowl last year pretty late. It wasn't something that I was intending on doing um, early on, but I, so I trained, I was going to go bowl the whole entire tour this year and you know, just bowl even better. And I was training for it pre COVID. And then I was like, well, <laughs> yeah. what do do now? I, I want to get back to that. Cause I know I read somewhere that you said that you, you actually, the, the, the tour took a toll on your body and that you needed to do some different preparation for it when it comes back. But I, I'm also curious, a lot of players come out on tour and if they don't have success, they, they might hear things about why, they're not having success or you need to throw the ball more like this person, or you need to change this in your game. And then they go down a rabbit hole and sometimes they don't recover from it. Did you find yourself going, going through that at all? Or, or was it just a, a, a physical thing? That's a great, that's a great <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I have a couple things that came into my mind about that. And I just, I don't, I don't believe that you should throw it like anybody else, right? So there are certain things that my husband and I talked about last year at the end of the year, even throughout the year where, you know, increasing rev rate is always going to be an advantage. So how do we at least get that a little bit better, right? Like hitting power. So I actually committed to doing that in uh, my practice sessions after last year going into this tour season. Um, As far as, you know, so can you just, is that kind of the answer to your question or do you want me to 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 use a specific example? Like I would consider you to be in the top 10% of, of rev rate on tour, right? Players. Sweet. Why, why, why want, why would you want more? What would be the reason for that? Oh, so in addition to Robert, Are there too many more, players in the top 10 that when they have it, you can't beat all of them? I think what, what I have from the way I understand it is, and the way that I you know bought into the idea is when we had to get really far left, which was a lot of the time last year, I needed to be able to like hit it just a little bit more in order to get it to see the back and carry the 10 pin. I left an absurd amount of 10 pins just for like, or not even that. It's just like, it would, you know, hook, stop, roll out, you know? So it was that factor. Um, Cause I can get in and circle it and, um, you know, but it was just to kind of like give it that little edge. I think Nebraska comes to mind where, you know, Jordan, the, wasn't it was very, I think Verity made, made a show there too. So like, they're just, I was up there but I wasn't quite at the show, right? So right. it's finding that, um, I because I think that's more suitable to my game than trying to work on playing straighter, which I tried to work on playing straighter for a long time and I got better at it, 
But I think where I'm going to really dominate is I think if I play to the strength of being able to, you know, get on it a little bit more, circle it and um, kind of lead that way. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. But it's tough. I mean, I think that's the thing that, that people don't realize is how many, like, even if you're good at something, there's going to be five or 10 players on tour that are just as good, if not better. And those are the ones you're going to have to beat when you guys all have it that week, right? Mm, yep. Yeah, exactly. So, oh my gosh, it's just, I like reflecting. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me <laughs> onto this podcast, guys. I appreciate it. It's fun talking about bowling. Yeah, I miss it. It's been a long time since I really like. What have you actually? When was the last time you actually bowled? Well, I'll tell you a little secret. Uh -oh. um, I'll tell the world. <laughs> it's bowl. too late. We're on. Yeah, you yeah. know, I named him. Millions of people are watching. <laughs> I hope millions. <laughs> uh, I did bowl for the first time in fourteen. I think it was about fourteen weeks. Wow. Uh, and it was, I took some videos and I started slow, you know, no step, one step, just to make sure that my, my old wrist here can, and then I took some full approach and it felt good. It truly felt like I was riding a bike. The video showed me that it was really slow. Okay. So okay. It might take did a you minute. have, did you lose all your calluses and everything? Did, oh, did your did. hand? Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, and it's actually even gone already. Um, I, I've got like a little, I tuck my pinky sometimes. So I got a little blister there and it hurt. Does your husband want to hold your right hand again now? <laughs> I know. Yeah, exactly. I <laughs> they once know. said that uh, shaking hands with a bowler is like sticking your hand into a bag of walnuts. Right, so, oh, yeah. that's good. No. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is yeah. true. My you wife know, actually holds my right hand now because I don't bowl anymore. That's so funny. Now they're all gone. Although I I never really had a lot of calluses on this side because I wear that tape. I never taped my fingers, but they were never, you know, all that bad. I think I lost this one. I get this callus too. I lost that one. Oh gosh, I'm a little nervous to get back into it. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's there's more to it than you know people people think. I think uh, mm -hmm. it's just being sharp. Uh, that you know that's another interesting thing is. You know, when when there are events to come back and bowl, you know, how long is it going to take before you feel like you're sharp and, and you're back to you know kind of how you you normally compete in, at the tournament level? I have to take a deep breath on that because I actually have an event in uh, five, wait, no, sorry, I need to do the math. Nine days ish, give or take. So two weeks, wow. I mean, a week and a half. Sorry, not this weekend. But next weekend um, in Ohio, because their bowling centers and everything have been open for a little while. Um, so hopefully within the next 10 days or so, I'm going to be sharper than sharp. <laughs> <laughs> you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah, we are going to um, we're going to find a way to practice here within the next few days. The thing is, is when I did go, I think I bowled for like 45 minutes and I was sore. So people I, I know a lot of my friends that aren't bowlers, they literally don't know how we do it, right? Because they're like, oh my God, every time I go bowl, like my whole arm hurts. And I was like, yeah, if we didn't bowl all the time, our bodies would hurt too. Yeah, I think I have a, I, I think this is a funny comment. <laughs> <laughs> is that someone who knows both of you guys? Yeah, he does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> he probably actually did. I don't know. Well, now he's doing all the all, all the, the deck building, and yeah, so he, you know, maybe his hands are finally not softer than yours anymore, yeah, right? They're probably not. <laughs> Test it out. Uh, so you mentioned the the bowling this month article. There's so many great things, and I the, the one that I read um, about preparation, um, and it and it, it covers a bunch of different topics, which um, I think everybody should read it first of all. So where can they find it? Uh, bowlingthismonth.com. And, and uh, how often do you write for them? I have a goal-ish to write once a month an okay. article for them. And cool. yeah, uh, which is really cool because the last one that I just put out has nothing to do with nutrition, but I feel very passionate about the topic and it's controlling what you can and then letting go of what you can't. And I made some pretty interesting bowling analogies where, um, oh, I'm gonna pull something out. Yeah. Oh, there's the this one was... that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool, so um, we can talk about that one. Do you want me to? Yeah, let's let's talk about this one. Yeah, sure. I've got a lot of questions. 
Okay. <laughs> I think do, you wanna, do you want me to just talk about it or you want to ask the question? Yeah. Well, okay. Look, first off, the first question I had was what's the difference between a process oriented goal and an outcome goal? Oh, yeah. That is some Tyrell Rose type of stuff. He writes a lot about on that. Um, and, you know, he's our Team Canada coach for a while. So process goal is, you know, I want to hit my target. I want to, you know, feel or like have a straight follow through or um, something in the moment, right, that you can or I want to have 90% spares. I would say that's more like process. It is a little outcome, but it, it's kind of like a target that has nothing to do with the competition. Um, and whereas an outcome goal can be where it has to do with the competition, where gotcha. you're like, I want to finish in the top five, or you know, I want to make the masters, stuff like that. Yeah, like Deandra had a really good example on the last show where she, she was talking about like you never go into a frame saying I, I'm trying to strike. Mm -hmm. That's the outcome. Yeah, the process is I want to stand here, hit my target, and make make a quality shot. Right. Yeah. 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 I think hers was stay down at the line. Yeah. Uh, I had, this is interesting. I, you said in the article that you spend 75% of your practice time on drills. I, I could not do that. True. Uh, I, I, I would, I would go crazy. Why is that important to you to, to spend so much time on, on, on drills? Because it's the process. <laughs> 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 like, like, like why why is it better to do that than just bowl 20 games and keep score like you would normally bowl like why is it better to do the drills um i the quote that comes to mind is insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result so that's my thought of practicing for scoring. You guys have a cute little smirk on your face there, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am in, I, some people have accused me of being insane. So that's probably why I just pulled that way and not didn't do the drills. I, I've been called insane. Too. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of other names too. You know, you know, Deandra said Shannon O'Keefe was crazy. And she said, that's the best compliment you can give somebody. So maybe, and I actually wrote that in my book as well. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you're trying to, well, that actually goes back to what I said earlier about don't try to throw it like somebody else. It, I have been there before where we were trying, we were all, you know, told to bowl in the same way and it was not comfortable. So when I was able to like do what I can do and what feels good along the same lines of, or on, along the lines of still having good fundamentals, um, then it, it's better. It's so much more repeatable. How I, and I'm, I'm going to get back to like the drill question. Um, you really want to focus on those skills when you're trying to learn a new skill. Say you go to a tournament and it requires you to get left of, you know, even 20 at the dots, but what about 20 at the arrows? And you're so uncomfortable with doing that. How do you expect to learn how to do it? So, that's where the drills come in when you now when you're doing those drills like for example i always struggled with 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 like walter ray and i used to argue over something he say you know when you go practice you should go out and try to play first arrow and i said well what if there's no shot at the first arrow what if the shot's at third arrow so just still play first arrow because if you can play it when there's not a shot there then you can play it when there is mm. i was like oh okay that makes sense mm -hmm. but like lofting the gutter cap for example like like or or playing very, very far left. How do you practice that when the, the conditions that you're bowling on don't call for that? That is challenging. Um, I, I feel how I've done it is asked the bowling center to give me a pair of beat up lanes, right? So just open play that's, or even the leagues that have been bowled on for a couple, you know, days because the bowling centers don't oil every day. <laughs> So that makes it easier to be able to get left. Um, and then I did actually, while I was training for the tour er earlier this year, there were a lot of like times where I would go to the bowling center and it, they'd, be, be, they'd be beat up and I would be able to just practice one step that far left. And then, you know, I would, it wasn't great ball reaction. You're not, unless, yeah. unless you're on the PBA tour and you're like having everybody there to kind of carve that in the pattern you're really not going to have great ball reaction but that doesn't mean that you can't at least try to see if you hit your target and what you're doing and then you know see what shape it makes 
Yeah, and, and, and you know, if you don't have good ball reaction, you know, if you don't throw it great, it's not going to do what you want it to do, right? Right. Yeah, I I do agree with Walter in that I have um, I've used my plastic ball on house shots to play the first arrow, even though you know, because nothing I couldn't use my regular ball, so right. it's like, you know, a reactive. So it's um, you gotta get creative and then really go in and part, that's part of what I mentioned in the article is you gotta go in there with a plan if you wanna. I do you know no steps one steps three steps just to feel and get timing and warm up. And, um, and I set a certain number of them that I want to get. And, or if there's like a, an outcome goal in terms of like how many strikes I want to get for each. And then I go into a couple skills that I want to work on. Yeah. I'm curious about the one, two, three step or three you know, step thing. It, it, in my mind, that makes sense in the way, like, like if you go watch a pro golfer, warm up for their round on on tour they they'll take a a, a wedge and they'll swing super soft 20 percent, and then once they feel like they're hitting the ball on the button then you then they start to go after it right is that kind of the same principle with that drill yeah for the most part it's um really just to kind of get the feel and i really rely on one steps and three steps for timing so just really making sure that i'm solid at the line and then getting into sometimes, you know, I don't always run with one steps, but it's also, I use those to work on release, release type drills. If I'm really trying to, or trajectory launching, launch angles, it's a lot easier when you only have one step to, to make something happen. than if you're trying to, you know, figure out when you're walking and swinging the ball and then trying to do something really minuscule right at the end of your approach. That's would fine. you ever like in the middle of a tournament switch to three steps? Like if your timing's off or something, would you ju would you just switch? I haven't, but I'm. Not... I know a lot of the men do it. Like if they have to, you know, play around the ball return, they go to one step or two or three steps. Mm -hmm. um, but I I don't think I've ever seen like Mike Durbin used to switch up the number of steps way back in the day. Uh, he actually won tournaments with three steps, four steps, and five steps. You know, just been depending on how his timing was, he would change it up. Wow. Uh, but I, I, you don't see that very often. I was just wondering if that was something you would incorporate. Not, I haven't. Um, and I would do a three step in front of the ball return. I think that that's also pos partially why I practice the three step. But also, um, I have, if I switch between four and five, it's typically if I go to four steps, it's because I need to throw it harder. And then five is comfortable for me. And everybody's different. So when people, like I've had, I've worked with junior bowlers that are like, well, you know, I, I heard that I should do six steps and I heard that I should do four. And it's like, well, let's just figure out what you feel, like where is your timing and what do you, do you need, do you want the extra step? Do you not, do you want to push it all the way at the same time? It's when you have to figure it out. Yeah, makes sense. I do have a few more questions on the article. I don't know if you want to step in Aaron and, and take a little break from that or if you want to keep going on the article. Uh, no, I think we're hitting Good. it. Good you good? You good? I, I'm All right. Now notes mentally from next time I go. All right. This is where things might get a little weird. So uh, visualization. You know, you talk in your in your story about like actually visualizing like what's going to happen the next day at your tournament, right? Uh, I know I've done that before, and and then I'd go out and shoot a hundred under. Uh, why is visualization uh, a benefit? There is a lot of research on when you, your mind actually doesn't know the difference between if, if you're thinking something, especially with your eyes and you're visualizing, right? And it actually happening. So they've done research on athletes, golfers. Um, I think golfing is the one that comes to mind right now of visualizing their their performance and then it's actually stimulating the same muscle groups that they would use in competition and when i found that out i mean i totally bought into it so i at first and maybe this is actually really helpful for some people that don't really know how to do it at first because because of the experience that i had had i could only ever picture doing something wrong and that was hard for me to get out of. Like I would just picture, you know, face planting, um, <laughs> or like sliding too much, wow. and then just 
chaos. It was terrifying. Wow. I didn't even want to do it because I was, and I think I don't, I'll have to talk to Ty about this again. Do you have any idea why? Did you ever figure out why that was the case? You know, I talked to Ty about it years ago when, when I first started doing it. Um, to, I really think. It sounds like the matrix, you know, when Neo's trying to learn how to do all the stuff in the matrix and he's like falling off the building and, <laughs> and then he figures it out and he's able to stop bullets. <laughs> It almost felt like that when I could actually visualize a good shot. I mean, I was mind blown when I finally got out of that negative space. Cause I actually, I asked, we were talking, we were working with a sports psychologist years ago and he would actually encourage us to close our eyes and visualize our shot before we even went, like not even just in the space that I talk about it in the article where if you're laying down and you know, if you have your eyes closed kind of in a meditative state and visualizing there. And I literally, I told Ty, I was like, all I picture is like elbowing it or, you know, um, falling on my face or get it like split big four. Like that's all I could picture. Wow. And I really, I don't know. Have, I want and you're to. still, you still haven't figured out like how to, how to, how to fix it. Oh yeah. No, I have now. Yeah. Okay. And well, how, tell me how, important. cause that's what I'm really interested in. Yeah, so that was the that was the epiphany of I now what I did was I it helps to picture the actual the atmosphere that you're you're going to be in, and so literally down to the way it smells and the lighting because some bowling centers you know have poor lighting so just you know picturing that um, the types of approaches how many lanes how it sounds so when you get into that space. Then you can, you know, take a look around, picture your competitors. And I, what I did one, one time I don't, successfully, because it, it, sometimes you, you know, get distracted. So it's hard to like stay focused, but you could even visualize what I've done is um, visualize like the practice session and it going through and trying each of my balls and, you know, seeing what they do and feeling comfortable. So I've actually visualized feeling comfortable because a lot of the time I would get panicked about what was going to happen or if my ball reaction wasn't what it was supposed to be then i would panic and go uh oh like what ball you know yeah. so or we're running out of time and i don't have a ball reaction kind of a thing yeah, so yeah. i would that, that happen to me all the time yeah i would visualize feeling calm and and trusting myself trusting the ball reps the process um and that's a great way to visualize that's a great um starting point and then also spares i mean just start with that if you can't physically picture your ball going down the lane and striking then and i'm you know I, i'm picturing that right now so if you can do it you could talk yourself through it and then you can um picture spares too oh my gosh you have no idea the color of your spare ball right um where you line up like you cannot literally visualize you getting up to the approach and what i do is i draw lines from the pin and i look at it and then i just like i like feel it come off my hand and then i watch the ball hit the pin and then so that's it's like all the way through i mean your brain's amazing i mean your brain like hope i'm hoping that we're not visualizing this show right now because i think i feel like it's going well right and so i, I hope it's really happening uh but <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> One thing I always had trouble with was like actually getting into the mental state to visualize. Like, like my brain wouldn't even let me get there. Like it just was thinking about like a million other things. How do you quiet your brain so you can even have that uh, experience? My first thought is meditation and practicing meditation in order to get there. We also worked with another sports psychologist um, at the training center in Montreal and she it's breathing exercises. And so she gave, I don't remember, there's multiple different ones, but if you focus on your breath to relax the body and you can even go do like a body scan where sometimes, and I go from head to toe cause the other app that I use, it was called headspace scan from head to toe. Whereas some other apps toe all the way up. So if you do that, then it takes that it allows your mind to stop thinking about all the crap outside and brings it inward. If you ever have trouble sleeping, that's the best thing you can do as a body scan because it completely relaxes your your mind and your body and allows you to, to go to sleep. Or you so, can just read my book. 
Oh, you know, that we offer for our programmer on my computer here. And I literally tell my clients it's great info, but it'll put you to sleep. <laughs> Yeah, the 20 people who bought my book, that's what they all said. So it's a great, it's like, it's a great cure for again. insomnia. Live in, live in the dream, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to get it. I'll read it. Hey, Val, going back to uh, talking about vis visualiza visualization. There that's we go. a hard word, right? It is. So many, so many syllables in that yep. one. Um, you know, when you were talking about having a hard time picturing essentially positive things and all the negative, how did you bowl confidently in those situations? <laughs> um, I didn't. So it was it was the transition from being at Nebraska to to bowling the way that I want to bowl. That's kind of where it happened. And so I had to relearn. I kind of had to relearn how to bowl. And I had to relearn how to think too, because um one of their philosophies was to think on the approach. And all of the mental training books that I read said the opposite. And so I was like, well, that's weird. So, and then, you know, we would do something wrong, like, you know, an elbow or trail leg would go up or something. And coach would literally ask what went wrong. So I would literally only be thinking about what went wrong. And so I, I think that's where it stemmed from. So I had to do a ton of um, mental preparation. I read, I read a lot of books uh, meditation helped a ton. And then the visualization of just knowing that I can, and it's one shot, right? Mm -hmm. you, you just visualize one shot and let your body do it. Then it, you prove it to yourself. You're like, Oh, I can strike. Okay, cool. We're good. Yeah. It's very interesting that you say that, uh, because, you know, Nebraska's had so much success. Um, is it, is it just because it's a team uh, environment that that's able to work there, you know, versus, or is it just a, an issue of talent? I think it's both of that. I really do think it's both. It, they definitely recruit. I had a, I had an amazing time at the school. It was an amazing for it. We had won a national championship. We had a, an amazing group of girls and we had each other's backs and we just had, we had a fight, you know, I get goosebumps thinking about it. We just, we wanted to win. And you just, you did. <laughs> so talent and um, cohesiveness. It's interesting that, but, but it's interesting that you have to have kind of a different mentality when you're bowling for yourself, right? Way different. Yeah. I loved the team bowling. I loved the team aspect of like yelling and screaming and, and I never bowled league during that time. So then when I would bowl league, I'd be like, woo, yeah, nice job. <laughs> <laughs> like, <Valerie>, calm down. <laughs> I don't normally get to be this excited with my fellow bowlers. I know. Well, right after they're like, "Wow, oh, you realize like we don't need to freak out every time you <laughs> cheer for me." Like, oh, all right, all right. I'll, I'm used to it. <laughs> so you you've been successful on tour. Uh, you know, you had obviously rookie of the year season. Um, but what what would you say is is the hardest thing about bowling on tour? What's the most important skill or quality that you think a player needs to have? Um, in order to succeed on tour, just, you know, in the time that you've had to kind of think about that? I would say mindset and goals and intention. Because if you don't have an intention and you don't have goals, how do you know if you're going to reach them? And, or when you're going to reach them? How do you know that you're there? And then, um, it, it's it's hard it's hard because I'm I'm trying to think of people that are going out there for the first time and they don't really know what to expect right if that's the case then you you do you can't go in there thinking that you're gonna win because odds are you're probably not so if you can take the learning um, or approach it from a curious curious standpoint you know be curious learn as much. I know Maria on a previous podcast said that she just wanted to learn all the time. And if she can, she has a classify, I don't know, I'm going to, I might jack up her words, but um, if you learn something, then you won kind of a thing. So I think the people that can recover from poor performances quickly, and by that, I mean, maybe a bad game, yeah. not even a bad event, 
Like if they allow it, those, okay. There's my answer. Thanks for letting me talk it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, go ahead if you want to keep. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. finish that thought. Yeah. My, yeah. my final answer is <laughs> 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 those who can recover, the, the, that is who succeeds. Those who can recover from a bad game and not let it become a bad block are those who succeed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wrote in my book about confidence and, and people don't think of confidence as something you have to manage, right? But on tour, if you don't have confidence, you have no chance because you're, you're going to run into 50 people that do and they're going to beat you, right? Yeah. yeah, it's the self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Of like, if you think, I think Henry Ford said, if you think you, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. So, right. Right. Oh gosh, just, yeah, believe you can. And then people get into the argument or the debate about, well, confidence versus arrogance and that sort of thing. But, and that's hard. I don't even know what the answer is to that, but. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things about the tour is that you have a lot of different players that are doing it for different reasons. And like one of the things we talked about with Deandra last week, the last show was how she's kind of past the, the point where, where this is her full time occupation. And so she, she comes out and bowls a few tournaments here and there. But, you know, I, I told I, I think personally, if she gets something she likes to bowl on. Uh, she has a chance, right? But she knows she's not what she used to be, right? And that's and she's fine with it. That's part of the choices she's made in life. What what about where do you think you are? Like you have you have a good job. It's it, you're you're very successful in what you're doing. Um, why are you out on tour? What's what is what are you trying to get out of it? Oh, I love that question. Uh, I really do because it took me a long it took me a long time to sit and really figure out why if I go out on tour, why am I going to be there? What is going to make it worth it for me? And I'm super competitive. I, if I didn't have bowling, I'd be competitive in something else, but, and that's a big factor, but that wasn't enough for me to really give it my all and essentially invest a ton of money um, in it. So what I set out to do was to, help more people to expose myself to more people to bowl proams to meet more people to to help if they're looking to help them with their health i have a lot of bowlers and so i know what it's done for them and a lot of them come to me with their reason why is because they want to bowl with less pain huge factor i mean they if they're they want to bowl and then a lot of them are wanting to bowl the pba 50 events and they want to be able to compete with those guys. And there's a lot of great guys out there right now because, you know, the ones that I watched growing up are now in the PDA 50 League. And they want to be able to at least compete with them, you know, pain-free. They want to be competitive. And so I'm like, I want to do that. I want to be able to go out there and um, help more people. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. Like in, in regular life, you don't get to know what, what, what ranking – you have right like like i don't know if i'm the thousandth best video producer in the country right there's I, it's just i have no idea i just try to be my best uh whereas on tour you know like you get the results every week <laughs> you know i was 42nd this week i was 31st i was second is that something that you uh that that you need you know just knowing that you're one of the best at something i mean you obviously are one of the best at something but is that does that carry over into other facets of your life? And is that why you think you need to be on tour? Nope. No. <laughs> that's that's my answer right now, whether that changes yeah. or not. Um I'll be I'll be honest and or I'll, you know, divulge divulge. I think that's the right word. That I only ever wanted to bowl collegiately. That was my goal. Mm -hmm. I, I never really I not that there was a tour at the time. Yeah, no, there was. No, not really. There really wasn't a PWE tour when I was in deciding to go bowl uh, college. And so I didn't think that I wanted to be a professional bowler because at the time, actually, I wanted to be a gym teacher. So I just wanted to teach, I guess. And then I just I fell in love with nutrition and, and I saw how it can help people. And so to to be the I love I respect I completely admire when people want to be the best like I love it and I will cheer them on um do I want to be a be the best in an event absolutely um 
but to be the best at something, I don't know. You, is, you is there a level of success uh, that if you don't attain it, you'll be disappointed when your time bowling on tour is over? Probably. What, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, that, it's so, you know, up until a couple of years ago, I didn't really even set goals. Uh, so funny. Um, I, I would like to be a world champion. Um, I need to decide how much that means to me before the next world event and then, you know, put value on it. And I think up to this point, I've, I've come close. I think I made the masters. Uh, yeah. At that event. Uh, I made the masters there and I had a monster block the last uh, day of team. I think it was, and maybe it was just the team atmosphere. I finally figured something out. I mean, we bowl in the same pattern every day for like a week finally figured it out and um and it was great so I just it is it's kind of a confidence issue I don't even know if I have what it takes to be there you know just because do I put in enough work to that's interesting to get there yeah I mean you're I mean you made the U.S. Women's Open show as an amateur you made you know one of your first shows coming out on tour obviously you're good enough but it's interesting to hear that you think maybe you're not yeah. Well, that just came into my mind. So, <laughs> you know. You're not committing to it. It's just one of those thoughts floating around that you. you know, yeah. You know. Thoughts are thoughts. That's what I've, I've also learned. And I, maybe I was too attached to a lot of those limiting beliefs before. So it, it is, I have to detach from them and dis, and it's a decision. They all, those doubts always creep in. I'm not the only one that doesn't think that she's good enough. So I'm a, uh... I'm curious yeah. now, um, you know, we talked towards the end of the season and at the beginning of the season, I think you were actually our first guest for on the road, uh, last year. And, uh, you know, you said you were only going to bowl the first four events, first four events, and then kind of see where it got from there. And obviously you had a strong start. I think you were seventh in Cleveland. So, you know, a top 10 right off the bats, um, but kind of what were those, you know, essentially, essentially those internal conversations like when you kind of got to that fourth tournament and you're like, hey, I, you know, I'm competitive. I can come out here. I can, you know, be with the best in the world. Uh, you know, what were those, you know, moments like for you just having those thoughts and obviously making the decision to go full time the rest of the way out? I think I wanted to like I wanted to compete full time. I wanted to be able to. I, I knew that I kind of, and, and it's not that I gave myself an out, but I, I gave myself like an ultimatum of, hey, you need to prove it. Like prove that you can afford to go out and bowl um, the rest of the time. And I did, and I just wanted to enjoy it. There were so many times that I would just sit there and kind of tear up just about the experience of competing Oh my God, like so many times I'm about to tear up right now. And I remember in California when I made the show, I mean, just being able to experience that part of the world too, or the country, I should say, um, go through the, we drove through the mountains and I just, I want to experience life. And so to, to compete at that level and to be able to compete up there with those, those girls, I mean, it just. I was in such a state of gratitude for the most of, most of the summer. I was really looking forward to the summer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and then seeing what I could do, I I hadn't got to the point where I set those No, I did. I did set the goals um before I talked with my coach and decided and I was really going to put I was going to hopefully win my first title th this year. So we'll have to put that on hold. <laughs> I, I know you were disappointed about not qualifying for the tour championship. Um, talk a little bit about that and what that event means to you and the rest of the players on tour. It's the best of the best, right? Um, it just, it proves that it's proof con consistency. And I believe in my life these days that consistency is everything. It's showing up when you don't want to, it's um, finding a way no matter what, and um, just week after week on pat completely different patterns. So it also shows versatility. And uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I've never experienced it. So I don't, I didn't know what I was missing, but I wanted to experience it. Yeah, it's really good. 
<laughs> you're gonna, cool. you're gonna enjoy it when we, when, yeah. when we, get, when we um, get yeah. to go. And I never, you know, I didn't set that goal either, or at least I didn't, you know, come prior from, to 19 season. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I didn't because I didn't know. I wanted to bowl the first four tournaments, and at what out. At one point, I was like, okay, there's a chance. Like, there's a really good chance that I could make it. And um, I didn't I mean, know. you were as close, was. right? You were like one yeah. spot out or two I spots out. Yeah. 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 I did not bowl well at the majors, and those are like triple point events. So, yeah, kind of screwed myself there. But is that one of your goals going into the next season? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Be cool yeah. to win it. That would be cool. Because it's, it's essentially match play, right? Like It is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, at that point, it's it's an amazing venue. Amazing. Um, plus, you get little, you know, cool gifts when you when you when you go. You get like a like a bracelet that has charms on it. And each year you qualify, you get a new charm on the bracelet. Oh, that's sweet. Sorry to make you jealous of everybody else. But <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really a cool event. <laughs> Yeah. I, and maybe, you know, I, maybe I need to know more about it in order to really make that decision or put, I don't know. I'm such a, an intention. I mean, my husband gets on me about this type of stuff all the time, but I'm like, you really have to be clear with what you want. And I, I think that that's really what people, and it's the limiting beliefs that people um, that they block themselves. You know, if you think, if you're so focused on what you can't do for X, Y, and Z reasons and excuses, you're never going to have it. So I've completely, I was like the queen of, I can't do this because this person, you know, is in my way, or I can't do this because my husband X, Y, and Z. And it's like, what do they have to do with your decision that you're going to make, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting uh, uh, problem. Uh, I know there's lots of things I would like to do in my life that I'm not going to get to do because if I want to be really good at this other thing, I just can't do them. But do you do you feel like there's going to be a point where where you have to ask yourself, hey, I need to I need to stop taking on all these clients if I'm going to you know be what I want to be out on this tour? Do you ever have that thought? Thankfully, I have a, an awesome team that I could, um, if I want, just hand over a whole bunch of clients. So, you know, if it gets to that point, then yeah, I I could, I could be able to do it. We'll see. I need to make, the, the, the hard part is, and I even talked to with one of my Team Canada teammates was the desire to bowl when everything was shut down, it was I was not itching. I can yeah. I can tell you that. I really wasn't. And I think that's because there was no, there was like no hope, right? Like there's there was nothing scheduled, nothing to work for. Um, and then as soon as we decided to go to this event in a couple of weeks, I was like, oh yeah, I gotta go practice. <laughs> so yeah. I think have events and those targets really help you make the right decisions in the moment. Yeah, it's so important. It gives people purpose. Uh, if you don't, I mean, like they talk about this universal income thing. And I think the problem with that is, you know, if you're giving people money and they have no reason to go out and work, I think, I don't think they're going to be happy. Like no. it's, I don't think it's good for them. It's, I mean, I know, I know other people think it's bad because it's like, well, I'm not giving my money to this person. They're going to sit on their butts. But I think people need to have something to do to, to, be excited to get up in the morning, right? Yes, one hundred percent. We talk about that all the time. In my as a health coach, so dietitians more like the nutrition health coaches. We sleep, stress, hydration, motion. I mean, hydration. I've literally been drinking this whole time, um, and that's a piece of it. Is what gets you up in the morning? What is what's going to if you didn't if money didn't matter? What would you do with your life? So, and and I can tell you the. The truth is I would do exactly what I'm doing right now if money didn't matter. Would I, and my mentor within my health coaching organization, he says that, you know, when money doesn't matter, you can go bowl all you want and it really won't matter. So perhaps that's what I'm working towards. Yeah, but I'm sure it feels pretty good to, to be able to help people, you know, the way you are with, with the other thing that you're doing, right? Yeah, it does. It 
And so I don't, I don't think I sit in it enough because I'm always just going from like one client to the next, you know, but I, it's so cool when people call me and they're like, I don't have pain anymore. I slept this one gentleman this morning said he videotaped himself sleeping and he doesn't snore anymore. And I'm like, that's amazing. Cause he lost um two, two inches off of his neck. Wow. Yeah, wow. and that's a big like sleep apnea, you know, the reason and snoring and it's a lot of the reason it's be, is because of neck fat. So, you know, I mean, just those quality of life things. So then you're sleeping better. So then you wake up without well, an alarm. Well, that just made me think I really need your help because I might end up getting a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just right. from the snoring. So, right, right. <laughs> then your relationships get better. <laughs> you're more patient. Um, when parents are more patient with their kids, I mean, that just, oh gosh, or if they're more paid, if they have a retail job, I've had a couple clients who say that they show up differently at work. How does that have to do with your weight? Do you know what I mean? It's just the yeah. connections. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it or, you know, and it's not even about physical fitness all that much. I love when my clients say that now they want to go for walks or they have the desire to go walk their dog and stuff. And meanwhile, they were in their terms, couch potatoes before. So it's just that quality of life. My mission truly is to improve people's quality of lives because we only have one life. Like we we're only here for a short period of time. Why not live it? And we never asked, did you ask did you ask God to be here, Jason? <laughs> I didn't. Well, at no. least I don't think I did. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't remember if I did. Right. So <laughs> nobody did. So why don't we just all try to get along, live our 80, 100, hopefully 120 years or something like that together. <laughs> <laughs> the way I'm eating, I, I don't think it's going to be 120. But yeah. Oh my gosh, my grandmother lived to nine, almost 100. She just passed away uh, last month and she was 99.9 .9 years old. She was wow. July 12th would have been 100. I was, I was like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. So I saw, it, side note, just about the whole health and kind of like wrapping that up. I saw what my grandmother did to live a healthy life. And I saw what other people were doing and they weren't as healthy, you know, hobbling around, um, all that stuff. And I was just like, man, there's gotta be a difference. And that's kind of how I got into nutrition. And Yeah, you yeah. talked a little bit about like people bowling pain free. I mean, uh, do you have any clients that you've actually helped with, with something like that? Like, and how do you, how do you attack that problem? A lot of it is inflammation. And that's such a buzzword these days. What inflammation is, is it's like a bruise in your joints. And so it's your body, a lot of the time attacking itself because of the high sugar. So your high blood sugar, high insulin. Um, oh, that's sweet. Yeah, Don, love him. Yeah, I met them through um, coaching. Her, her daughter, his, his, I think she's lost like 40 pounds or something. That's amazing. Let's live our best lives. Heck yeah. Preach. <laughs> I've never been called a preacher before. <laughs> I love it. Um, so, you know, blood sugar spike, insulin, insulin comes in. And then um, there's a lot of other mechanisms that happen. But a lot of the time it's because of high sugar, trans fat. So like deep fried foods, your body just it like attacks it almost and it harnesses in your joints. Um, again, I'm not being very scientific at this point, but we all know the pain that we feel from these things. And, um, and then also it could be, you know, it could even just be like the artificial stuff like preservatives and um, pesticides and just stuff that's not really supposed to be in our bodies. Um, it causes joint pain. So what we do with the, the fuelings have no artificial flavor, sweeteners and colors. So it's a big factor. And then it also regulates blood sugar. So you're not having those spikes and drops. And then, um, and then, so it just like flushes out a lot of that inflammation. Uh, and you can do that with whole foods. There's yeah, no I, I, I remember reading in, in your article about how like you don't drink anything that has artificial sweetener and you don't drink anything that has sugar in it. So what yeah. do you, what the heck do you drink? 
right that, with it. Aren't there, like just water, right? Yeah. So that's actually, we have these things and they're, unfortunately, they're getting rid of them because they weren't super popular with people um, in our company. It's called purposeful hydration. And so it had it vitamins, but it's sweetened with stevia. Actually, it has some like regular sugar in it, but I don't know five grams per packet and I mix it with 30 ounces. So pretty um, negligible. And then I do drink soda water and okay. I don't drink regular soda. But it doesn't have sugar or chemicals. No sugar. Yeah, just no chemicals. carbonation. Just carbonation. Okay. Yep. Sometimes I put like lemon juice, lime juice. Um, what else do I drink? I drink red wine. Okay. That's um, good. Kombucha. Oh yeah, my wife drinks that. I, I, I hate it. It's terrible. It's gross. <laughs> what is that? I have no idea what that is. Yeah, it's, it's good. Don't it's, smell it's, it before you drink it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it sounds bad and it tastes bad. Yeah, uh, but she she drinks it and she can stomach it and it's good for you and she's gonna live to be 120 and I'll, I'll she'll be living for 40 years after I'm well. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> Sounds like she's a good influence on you. <laughs> she is. Yeah. I think that's it. I mean, sometimes I drink the occasional like hard seltzer, you know? What do you drink while you bowl? Not alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what do you mean? Don't, don't all, don't you get better at bowling and more alcohol you drink? Isn't that what everybody says? <laughs> well, Sorry during the week, absolutely. I will have either a glass of wine or something, hard seltzer maybe. <laughs> um, but, you know, professionally, we are not allowed to drink alcohol. Um, and typically, I would say, yeah, water. Um, I bring, I always bring my, my water with me everywhere I go. So I always have a, a water bottle. It's a good tip. Uh, I know hydration was a big thing in, in the story as well. Um, you know, I thought it was an interesting point you made about if you don't drink water, then your body recycles water from other places. And so it's basically, you basically have dirty water recycling in your body, right? It's so gross. Isn't that gross? It is. Yeah. Yeah. When I read that, it's in, again, it's the book that is underneath me. I need a, a desk stand. Um, <laughs> yeah, I could, you know, it's in one of the textbooks that I read and, um, isn't that, that totally motivates me to hit my 64 ounce goal. Like it's bare minimum. Every single person should have at least 64 ounces of water a day. So, you know, if you, if you get more awesome, but it's your, like your brain uses water, your skin, your organs, your muscles, gotta drink the water. That's what my wife preaches at home all day, every day. And she always tells the kids, you know why you got good skin? Because I drank water while, while I was pregnant with you. So and, and, cute. And they just laugh at her. And, I, love, I got to yeah. move away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Aaron, you got any other? I know there's a lot of questions on our list that we didn't get to. Oh, uh, well, we actually got to quite a few of them. Uh, I think, I, I know there's one thing you wanted to, wanted to bring back around with something about the gauntlet. Oh. Uh, but before have, you, we... have you learned any more words that start with the letter Z <laughs> since the gauntlet? I, and I did learn the other joke too. I, I remembered it. Should we should we watch should we review that uh, that that lightning round? That uh -oh. thirty seconds of, of fun. Uh, let's do it. Why not? Let's uh, let's bring that up here. This let's is see. so funny. Yeah, yeah this was fun. Um, I did actually. It's so cute. I was telling my husband. He goes, "Yeah, xylophone," and I was like, "Oh, honey, that's an X." <laughs> yeah, that's. That, I think that was actually. Let me uh, yeah. share the audio too, because audio is important with this one. But uh, yeah, I think that was that was the the mental block, right? You, you mm. just keep thinking of the word xylophone. Yeah, and it's like and I can't kept, stop thinking I about xylophone. Thinking, yeah, I kept thinking about like zebra, and you know, and then um, zero came up after that, and I was like, what? There was something. There were a couple others. Um, yeah. Okay, here we go. I got it. All right, the scores are verified. It's going to be hard skiing for you here, Valerie, as, well, actually, it's not. Alicia got two, two oh. right answers. You probably were thinking, oh, my, oh my God, I'm going to okay. kill her. This two, is easy. No way. I was like, this is going to be hard. She's <laughs> smart. Uh, that means you're going to need four, four correct answers in order to take home the victory. All right, Valerie, are you ready? <laughs> no. <laughs> 30 seconds on the clock. As we get started, Valerie, 
name as many words as you can that start with the letter Z. Go. Zebra. <laughs> That's a lot of them. 30 seconds. Zebra. Um, Zenithan Bell. And uh, Zenobia. That's a name. <laughs> uh, nice try. Oh, no, help. Um, That's hard. <laughs> Time. Oh man, I'm sorry. We had to. Make oh my god, so that. I don't think like my teeth actually hurt right now from like laughing. <laughs> so you laughed so hard. It I was. I had a headache for like four hours. After that. <laughs> you were laughing so hard. I mean, so I couldn't spell. I don't watch Harry Potter. I don't, hey, know. I don't know how to me spell neither. Gryffindor. <laughs> you played the ukulele. Yeah, I, I know. I know. He's, oh my gosh. It was so funny. I like died. Oh, that was a fun time for sure. Oh, and the, the joke. So I was like, I should have just asked my husband. So he said, um, how much does a polar bear weigh? I don't know. Enough to break the ice. Hey, I'm done. <laughs> ah, fantastic. That's how, That's is, that how he, is that how he met you? No. Oh, okay. no. That was in his pickup line. <laughs> he's, he's so funny that way. He knows so many. I think he had a couple other ones that weren't um, quite appropriate, but you know. Well, your your kids are going to love those jokes when, uh, when uh, you know, they're like four years old. Yeah. She knows yeah. that it's harder. Dad yep, jokes. She knows. Dad jokes. Mm -hmm. Now we're hitting, uh, we're hitting, uh, we know you have a meeting coming up soon. So I think we got two more topics we want to want to kind of hit before we get there. So 2019, obviously very cool rookie of the year made a show. Uh, but there were two interesting moments, two surprises for the year for you. And so I want to hear how they kind of ranked. So uh, first off, we'll go back to Lincoln. So obviously some ties there to Sun Valley Lanes, John Lucido, and you had one of the, uh, toughest breaks all year, unfortunately. Sorry. We're just, we're just rolling out one bad moment after another here for you. Valerie. <laughs> but the important part is you struck the first 11 times before. Yeah, that's true. true. Yeah. So, oh my gosh. You're going to have to, oh God. <laughs> to see this again. So this is for 300. And come on. What? That's that's not real. That's fake. That's a fake video, Aaron. That's so fake. <laughs> it was on Instagram, so it has to be real. <laughs> but the next day, because John Lucido is like the nicest guy in the history of the world. Yes. He comes up, and we have this announcement right before the squad. And I'm pretty sure you didn't know this was happening either. And John presents you a check for two hundred and ninety nine dollars and fifty cents. Yeah. Yeah, there was like wasn't it like a three hundred dollar three hundred game bonus or something? Mm -hmm. Or yeah. Yep, three hundred dollar bonus. And I actually had that in my mind. Like I wanna earn an extra three hundred bucks. Why wouldn't I? <laughs> 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 and then that happened and I was like, come on. And that was actually another big goal of mine was to get a PWB 300. That's such a cool thing. And then of course I was like, two nine and a half. That was, I mean, John Lucido, seriously love the guy. I, I bowled at Nebraska. So I was there for four or five years and he was such a great proprietor then. And I mean, there, there's a reason that he's a successful proprietor. I was just floored. I loved it. And then he bowled, didn't you bowl 300 a few weeks later? I did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the tour. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Such a cool experience. The, la the oh, last 300 in that bowling center. <gasps> did they tear down? And Liz Culkin oh. almost, almost got it, but she got a bad oh, That was hard. I saw that <laughs> on her um, podcast. Yeah. Or somewhere. 299 yeah. and it wasn't a 299 and a half, but it was 299. Uh, yeah, that's true. So you yeah. you're the only person with the two ninety nine and a half all year. Yeah. So that is good. I uh, tell non bowlers that, and they go, "Is that for real?" And I'm like, that half a point. <laughs> uh, you know, the second surprise, and you, we saw Tanil hop in on the chat. So we're at the Players Championship. It's the end of the year, um, and you get a call into her office. And unfortunately, I we don't have the video for this. I wish we did. And 
I'll kind of let you explain it because you were the one who had to go through it. So Tennille, a little bit of a prankster. So yeah. you, you get the call into the office. I'm there. Mm -hmm. Curtis is there with the video camera. What happened there? Yeah. And so, oh my gosh, thinking about it, like a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> Can you visualize that? No, yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, picture the back of my mind. And they, I think, I believe, and it's, it's pretty traumatic, but I think Chuck was brought in, you know, as evidence or witness. Mm -hmm. And Chuck um, Gardner. Yep, Chuck Gardner. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He was brought in and it, he had no idea. And so he couldn't even give me a tell or something. <laughs> And Curtis is filming and he goes, you know, we just need to get this on video because we need to ask you a few questions. And Neil was just like, what? so serious. I mean, just so serious. So, you know, we, we rechecked your eligibility for rookie. And I was like, yeah. She goes, did you really check on it though? <laughs> and I, I was like, <laughs> yeah. uh-oh, exactly. Uh, I was like, Yes, I swear I emailed like eight people. I like I made sure I emailed Emil, Janiel, like just I checked all of my calendar. I checked just everything. And I and I can't remember now if it's six or seven events, but um either way, I said I only bowled those events and it's less than, you know, seven events or something. And she goes, I mean, it's just like po dramatic pop. <laughs> no and I was like oh my god I was like so what do we do I was like are you serious I'm looking at Chuck and Chuck's like just as petrified as I was <laughs> I was like what do we do and then she was like oh, I'm just kidding uh, <laughs> like, you got rookie of the year congrats <laughs> <laughs> like, so do you guys even have the video I don't, I, I think never we do. Him, yeah, I think we have it. It's uh, because somewhere. of the COVID thing. We've got it somewhere at the office and we, just, we were gone for a few months. So we'll have to dig it up. But yeah. Oh my, yeah, I never saw it. I was like, oh my gosh, unreal. I was like, seriously, I bowled this whole year for nothing? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> for nothing. <laughs> I don't, I it was, oh my gosh. How cool, crazy. how cool is that rookie of the year trophy? Um, Pretty freaking cool and heavy. Here, let me show you. Yeah, it's it's heavy. <laughs> oh my god! It's so <laughs> Here it is. Yeah. I have to get, and I think it's actually too heavy because I'm I'm gonna get shelves again. We just oh yeah into our uh, make sure you're in a stud. And, um. Oh my gosh, we. Uh, I, yeah, I don't. I think it's two. Yeah, hearts. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it might be too heavy to go on a shelf, a floating shelf, because I want a floating shelf. I think yeah. it would be too heavy. I was like looking up all these shelves that can hold fifty pounds, because um, I swear it's heavy. I don't know how much it actually weighs, but it's heavy. It's. I think it's like thirty pounds. Is it? Yeah. 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 yeah probably about two bowling balls. Yeah. It's. <laughs> Yeah, it's they're heavy. I, I I know we have to when we have to move them around on the set. I'm like, oh man, do we have people for that? Yeah. Have to, have to do everything around here. <laughs> Funny, somebody else to do it. Well, that's all you got, Aaron. Oh, um, that was your last last couple of questions. We got one more, and then okay. uh, then we'll uh, we'll say goodbye for the day. But uh, Valerie, obviously. Uh, you know, everyone's staying home a little bit more. So what are your binge watch recommendations for the good people out there? Oh, uh, yes. Mm. Yeah, let's... Okay. So confession, I I don't watch TV. Oh. Yep. I, I haven't in a really long time. We got rid of cable years I, ago. I know you said in your article that you've been reading yes. again, right? Since it's, So maybe we, maybe we do like a reading binge this, read this is uh, list instead of because yeah. i've written down like three books that yep. you've, you've I got lots of books. So. mindset carol dweck is a really good one so that's actually what i do i don't i don't binge on tv necessarily uh, i binge on podcasts and audiobooks i just listen to them all the time um which podcasts i the impact theory by tom bilio is really good he interviews some of the 
greatest of all time, like Deepak Chopra, Sadhguru, just like um, Gabby Byrne. I don't know, just tons of greatest of all time. And then audiobooks, I'm actually currently reading right now called a, a book called The Obstacle is the Way. And that is enlightening. I mean, just the fact that you, your obstacles, if you just, if you focus on them, you know, that's all you're going to see. But if you actually think, how can I use this to help me? You know, not why me, but like, you know, what is this here to teach me? Huge mindset shift. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, there's a couple on like public speaking <laughs> that I read. Grit by Angela um, Duckworth. Start with Why by Simon Sinek. I'm, I don't know. If you're not like into the personal growth space, then you're not going to know any of these that I'm talking about. But um, The Champion of Mind is actually a really good book for bowling. I, I listened to that probably about 15 times last summer. Do you, do you just typically stick with nonfiction? Uh, or, or are there any uh, fiction books in there? No. no. Who's your favorite nonfiction writer? Uh, it's a great question. Um, you have a lot of good questions, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Nonfiction writer, probably. I really like. You ever read Eckhart Tolle? Oh, yeah. The Power yeah. of Now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. game changer for me a long time ago. Uh, I read a lot of similar stuff like that. I would say there's a guy named Gay Hendricks. And he taught him, he wrote The Big Leap and stuff about conscious living, conscious loving. So I would say, just because I have a lot of his books on here, I would say that's probably, but I have so many of just different. Like who do you, who do you love reading? Like you just love reading their books. They're just, like I love Malcolm Gladwell. I love oh. reading his books, right? Yeah. So did you read The Tipping Point? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I that was hard for me to get through, to be honest. And this was really? a, yeah, I don't because I'm Canadian and I had to read all the history stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, the stuff about like Paul Revere and stuff. Yeah. Like, you Although, Canadians don't care about that. You know, Do you guys I, care about Hamilton? I have no idea. Like, like Hamilton was a big thing here, right? And it's it, they just re released it on Disney Plus for Fourth of July, and I I was like, I wonder if Canadians care about Hamilton. Nope. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> okay, so nope from my my very boxed perception. Like I live in a box. I I live in my own little world. My husband used to say, "This is Valerie's world, and we're all just living in it." <laughs> and I'm I never. I think I'm taking more to history now, but in school, I just I literally thought it was useless. For some reason, I don't know. I just so I never dove into it, which it makes no sense to to do that. That's very ignorant, you know. Just to say, like, there's a lot of lessons to be learned in history. So I'm getting into it now. I'll have to check that out, Hamilton. I, the see, okay, I will watch stuff like that. I have watched yeah. The Blacklist. I'm kind of a uh, okay. like weird shows like that. Um, Scandal. So before, but I'll watch an episode a month. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's very slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when I sit down and I start watching it, I literally I'm like, oh my god, there's so much drama. Yeah. And yeah, like I well, I come home from work and my wife will be watching it and there'll just be people screaming at each other. And I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm unwinding. I'm like, that's unwinding? <laughs> it's like stressful. I can't I have to go in the other room. Like I can't like we have enough yelling at work. I don't I don't need, you know, more yelling in my life. I feel right. the exact same way. I literally, I'm like, why are they yelling at each other? <laughs> oh my God, take a deep breath. <laughs> yeah, and then the other thing, my wife, I'm, I, I, hopefully she's not watching, but um, she, she hates guns, right? We live in Texas. Everybody has a gun. She hates guns. All the shows she watches are like people shooting at each other the whole time. And I'm like, <laughs> what? I Really? Oh my, maybe that's why she hates guns because she knows what it does in the movie. That's hilarious. Yeah, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, my, I mean, my husband likes guns. I was never, I guess I could say I was against them, but then you know, I married an American who was in the army, and so I like had to like, I have to like guns. They're yeah, they're my house. So or like I'm a, I can be around them, and so I was like, let's learn how to use it, you know, just in case. Whatever. Well, that's a lesson there, all you all you potential stalkers out there. 
Don't mess I know, with right? Valerie. There you, you go. Might, you might be exactly. packing. <laughs> yeah, I haven't had to worry about anything like that. Thank God. I know that there's such great people in this world, but I used to be anti. I was like, why do we need guns, right? Um, they're not going away. That's the reality. They're not going away. So just be, if you, the more comfortable you are, the, I think the better you'll be, the better off you'll be. Just accept it. Just accept it. Yeah. There's no chance that, you know, guns are happening in Canada because we're just different up there. I don't yeah, live in Canada though. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but I, I just always thought, I just thought, thought it was interesting. I, a lot of the things I was thinking about when we were talking about talk, you know, interviewing you was, you know, just like the perceptions of Canadians, you know, to things that Americans are doing. I always thought that was very interesting. Like, you know, we're just right across the, the way from each other, but there's such a different, you know, mentality on, on everything. It's just, I thought, I always thought it was really fascinating. It is. Uh, and I can say that I think my mom likes President Trump. So, you know, there are Republican and conservative or Republican and Democrat. I don't think we call them Republican in Canada. We call them like conservative and liberal. Like okay. so there are, you know, different types of Canadians as well. Um, although I think that just because we have more cities, like big cities uh, in general, I guess. And they all, I think I read a statistics of like, they're like a hundred miles from the American border. So, um, or the majority of their, the population lives in Within a hundred miles of America. Yep. Yeah. Southern mm -hmm. part of Canada. Um, I, I feel like it's just a little bit more of a liberal type of com country where, you know, we accept everybody, come on in. It's very multicultural, very diverse. And so we, when I moved to Nebraska for the first time, I looked around and I was like, why are there so many white people here? <laughs> I literally had no idea. And cause I grew up in just such a multicultural and it was, it was awesome. I loved it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. Cause I got to experience so much, so much like of the world in Toronto. And then yeah. that, that's what stemmed my, I think that's what stemmed my love for traveling and going to see different parts of the world and, and experience other cultures. What's your favorite uh, city in the U.S.? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me. I was like, eh, city in the world. You were, you were hoping, <laughs> yeah, you, you can answer that question too there. But uh, mm. yeah. City in the U.S. Oh, gosh. Uh, I really like, I really like Boston. I really do. Um, do I want to live there? No. Um, that's pretty, I really, okay. You know what? I loved Dallas. I really did. I almost went to school there. I'm thankful I didn't cause I'm not sure I would have met my husband cause I went to school in Rhode yeah. Island. What's school? Uh, Baylor, I think. Oh, oh yeah. It's, it's not quite Dallas, but it's, it's pretty close. like two hours away, but yeah. Yeah. I think it was, they have a dietetic internship program there, but I had, I had bowled there in college and I just, I loved it cause the weather was great most of the year. You know, yeah. um, there was a city type feel, but also kind of country. Yeah. And I, I, I grew up in the city and I don't want to live there anymore. Um, I want, I like small town feel, but not like super rural. Yeah. So will I end up there? I'm not really sure. Have you, have you spent a lot of time in California? Yeah. And I didn't, to be honest, I really, I didn't love Sonoma as much as I thought yeah. I would have. And I definitely did not like LA. Oh my okay. God. Gosh, that's interesting. So much traffic and yeah. it was beautiful. It was really cool. Um, you know, I think we went to. Did you, were you surprised by the smog? A little bit. Toronto's similar to that. Uh, okay. yeah, I think that was a turnoff for me too. Yeah. It was yeah. very, very smoggy and hot. And we, we hiked up to the Hollywood sign. Super cool. Yeah. Um, I just don't think I would want to live there. I lived there for 35 years. Holy cow. <laughs> That's a long time. You know, yeah. I've heard, I mean, most people love it there. I know, I feel like the more people I talk to from Oregon, they, they love it. Yeah. Oregon. I lived in Seattle for four years. That was a cool place. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I go to Vancouver all the time. Mm, I love Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah. I've never been. I, so the, I was, I don't know who I was. I was on another podcast and we were, Felicia Wong and I were going to go from Calgary all the way down to Tucson, all the way up to Spokane, 
all the way, you know, to Sacramento. We were going to do that whole tour of the Pacific Northwest. And we didn't get to. Uh, why not? Why not? <laughs> the tour. Oh, was, this year you were going to do yeah, it. This yeah, this year. Yeah, we, were, yeah, we, were, yeah. we spent yeah. months planning that to go to from uh, mm -hmm. We were just going to drive bad. and, um, you know, that's the thing is as soon as it happened, of course we were bummed. We were so bummed about it. But at the same time, I was like, man, that's out of my control. I just, there's nothing at this point that we can do. So what is talking about it going to do? And yeah. I think we're still, I'm still, because we did plan it and I still have that thought in my mind, I think I'm going to do that because there's a bunch of states up in that area that I really still want to see and experience. You will get to. Yeah. Hopefully Maybe. it'll be as part of, you know, a PWBA season. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> do you guys, I mean, not that, you know, may, you may not even know the answer to this, but it, do you think the stops are going to be the same or do you have to like rearrange the schedule? It has to be rearranged a bit. Um, it, yeah. Tennille basically just let them all get in line and cause, cause we had already started working on 21. Uh, so <laughs> it was largely finished. Oh, that's true. So, so yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, they all, all the hosts were great. They, they all want to have the tour back. So it's just a matter of putting them in a queue and uh, deciding when we, we get to go back to each one. But, you know, the, the, the feedback we've gotten on the PWBA tour from the hosts has just been amazing. You know, they just, they just rave about how great the, the women are with all of the fans and uh, they love having you guys. So um, they're all looking forward to, you know, being able to have the events, you know, when, whenever we're able to have them. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm exci I mean, I'm excited. I don't know about, I can't speak for anybody else, but I'm grateful that there is a tour, you know. Yeah. So are we. So Very are we. It. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't think we're going to break our record. Uh, were you trying? I really yeah, we're, weren't trying. I mean, we could. We could. Um, but I, you know, I know you have some uh, somewhere to go. So yeah. uh, this might be a good place to say till next time you think sure well it's been really awesome having a chance to learn more about you and hear all the uh the, the, especially the thing about you know, how many people that you're helping i think mm -hmm. people probably didn't know that about you and i think that's so cool uh you know in my book i write you know the the, the only way to make money in this life is to help people and so the fact that you're doing that you know but but there's also you know the other side of that you know it, it's good for your soul to help people and so it's i'm really happy that you found that in your life uh, i'm also happy that you know you have the tour to to you know do some fun stuff as well and see how how great you can be at that and i uh, really can't wait to see how you do next year when we have the tour back mm, awesome thanks jason i love that i i do i believe that uh, well, I've heard it before. I don't remember who said it, but if you help enough people get what they want and you get what you want. So pretty much the same thing. I can't wait to read your book. <laughs> yeah. Thank I you. mean, you know, if you're having trouble sleeping, it's, it's really helpful. <laughs> <So fun. laughs> Thank you, guys, I appreciate you inviting me on and spending an hour and a half together. We'll do it again. Hopefully. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks. Val. See you soon. Stay safe. Mm -hmm. Hey, you too. Bye guys. Bye. Well, sir, that was a lot of fun. That was. That was, uh, as we mentioned, we had, uh, or before before we started the show, you mentioned you really hadn't had too many opportunities to talk to Valerie in, in depth. And, you know, we've, we've had one or two of, uh, conversations during the tour last year, but that was the first time really getting to sit down with her for an extended amount of time like this. And, yeah, absolute, uh, absolute pleasure. You know, there definitely were a lot of takeaways. Uh, you know, we talked – you know, probably not as much about bowling as I thought we may at the beginning, but I think that made it even better. Uh, although there's a lot of great stuff, the visualization portion of it was very intriguing. And hearing about the practice routine, the drills, uh, you know, definitely got me thinking about some things in my own game. But uh, yeah, I can definitely, you know, a, a new appreciation for what she does for for others in, in her line of work. That that was uh that, that was the big takeaway for me and just kind of learning more about that and learn, learn the process of that is, uh, is pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, she's such an exceptional person. You know, Deandra said on the last podcast about how many 
great people there are out on the PWBA tour. And I mean, she's absolutely one of them. Um, you know, it, it's really fascinating to me. I'm really curious to, to watch her career as it unfolds. I mean, she understands the process and how to get great at something. You know, the question for her is just whether she she's going to fully believe it, believe in herself and commit, you know, to, to, you know, doing what she wants to do. Um, there's just no doubt in my mind, if she wants to put her mind to it, she could be a, a multi-champion on, on tour for sure. Uh, I, I, I would so, agree with that. Yeah. 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 And but, even just the preparation she had kind of talked about looking ahead to the 2020 season, uh, kind of compared to 2019, you know, for, yeah, I, I would chalk her down for a title or two. Yeah. She's definitely got her stuff together. And, and if you have any, uh, if you need some help with, uh, with your diet, I mean, she's the one that you're going to want to talk to. So feel free to hit her up on, uh, on our Facebook page or, or wherever else that you might be able to find her, you know, check out our articles on bowling this month. They're really, really well-written and uh, helpful. Uh, I know I got a lot out of it personally. It was a lot of fun to ask her, you know, her insights about, you know, some of those, some of those things that she's written and uh, just a great person. So uh, looking forward to having a tour. So all these great ladies can come back and bowl. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, we'll just keep having fun and talking to people. Yeah, we will. And we will continue that uh, a little bit later this week on Bull TV. Tomorrow, uh, Matt Canzara and myself will be back on Inside the OC 2013 regular singles champion Zeke Bate uh, will be on the show. So that should be fun. Zeke's definitely uh, one of the great characters out there in the sport of bowling. So always enjoy talking to that young man. And then you and I will be back Friday for a special edition of the PWBA podcast looking at the PBA League draft and kind of a breakdown with the Miami Waves. And we'll even have a few of the uh, few of the team members on as well to get their uh, essentially first takes of trying to win the league. So that's going to be super fun. That's a very intriguing team. I like that team a lot. And so uh, it'll be fun to, to kind of see them all mixed together for the first time, really, uh, here on the PWBA podcast. Yeah, looking forward to talking about it, sir. All right, JT, another great show here. Big thanks to our special guest, Valerie Bersier, the 2019 PWBA Rookie of the Year. So with that... We kept everyone around for right around hour 40. So this is going to be our, our time now. So we're going to like look at different levels to get. So Valerie finished second. Second. So, it's so good. we're, it's pretty we're two good. for two. Second's so pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, have a great, great Wednesday. We'll see you soon. Be sure to follow us uh, across all platforms. And uh, yeah, we'll see you soon here on Bull TV. Thanks again and be safe.